And well, the the next one will be disseminated: breast cancer, uh, live longer and better. What our patients uh, can uh, look for, uh, Alexandro, Gen Alexandro of Genari, Italy, please. Good afternoon, and thank you for uh, this invitation. Uh, my talk will be on uh, advanced breast cancer, and will be mainly focused on chemotherapy. Because actually, we must take into account that uh, all, also all data for uh, targeted therapies, including those presented at ASCO this year, clearly indicate that targeting only one pathway is not the answer to metastatic breast cancer. Moreover, all metastatic breast cancer patients will require chemotherapy sooner or later during the history of their advanced disease. So the important is how to optimize the chemotherapeutic treatment of advanced breast cancer. Well, first of all, we must take into account that Metastatic breast cancer patients are represented by a very heterogeneous population requiring tailored treatments and different types of chemotherapeutic agents. In fact, you have the symptomatic patients with poor performance status where treatment, where symptoms palliation is the primary treatment goal. Then you have the elderly patient with poor performance status and indolent disease. And actually, in this patient population, improvement in time to progression and quality of life are to a reasonable endpoint to be pursued. Then you have the disease that is still amenable to local regional control where you can achieve a complete response, which is still important when we talk of chemotherapy. And here you can actually administer the most active agents. And also in those patients where you have young patients with good performance status and visceral metastatic disease, and here actually prolongation of survival, as I will show you later, is a reasonable and achievable endpoint. Other factors that needs to be taken into account when choosing chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer is the tumor biology. The uh, tumor uh, aggressiveness, that is the duration, for instance, of disease-free survival from the diagnosis of early breast cancer, uh, the presence of visceral disease, and the extent of metastatic spreads and number of metastatic sites. Then, of course, we have also the opportunity uh, to use multidisciplinary treatments. Also, if in ASCO this year, we actually saw that this approach may not be uh, the optimus, but in some cases it can be still used by the, um, the use of surgery, radiofrequency ablation, or radiotherapy. And then, of course, the patient itself, uh, his preferences, her symptoms, and her type, her comorbidities. So we have uh, a few challenges when we talk about chemotherapy uh, nowadays. For instance, we have that uh, several novel chemotherapeutic agents have been introduced in recent years. And the introduction of new agents has always been shown to be um, linked to an improved survival, as I will show you. Uh, we must take also into account that the chemotherapy has been shown to consistently prolong survival in metastatic breast cancer. Uh, and we know this from the natural history of hormone refractory disease in patients who refuse chemotherapy. We know this from meta-analysis comparing different chemotherapy regimens, from data come from cancer registries, and from data from clinical trials performed over different periods. This is the case series from MD Anderson Cancer Center that was published, probably the, the first one to be published. And as you can see here, there is a clear, no, I did something, I'm sorry. Uh, there is a clear benefit in, uh, in, there is a clear improvement in, uh, in, in the more recent years with the use of chemotherapy. There is a clear improvement in overall survival. And also, this is our series, this were uh, 600, more or less, consecutive patients that were enrolled 
in through six consecutive clinical trials our first line chemotherapy. And we were able also to show a significant improvement in median overall survival in the most recent years. However, this improvement in, uh, in uh, overall survival was linked to the introduction of paclitaxel in the regimens that we were studying in those years. So we show a significant improvement in overall survival, but this was linked to the addition of paclitaxel to all these anthracycline containing regimens that we were studying in these studies. So, so actually, other, um, other issues that needs to be taken into account when we uh, treat with chemotherapy metastatic breast cancer is what is uh, uh, reported by the different guidelines that we have all over the world. So all these guidelines convene that Overall survival improvement can be achieved, that they are important, but of course that being the patients with metastatic breast cancer, um, a serious disease that leads to death the patients, also quality of life has to be taken into, into account. So the treatment, of, the treatment goal is to maintain the patients alive as long as possible, but with good quality of life. And I think that with novel agents, actually, this is something that can be achieved. Another important uh, issue in uh, when we administer chemotherapy in terms of, especially in terms of treatment optimization, is the opportunity to administer sequential single agents versus combination chemotherapy. This is actually uh, been uh, uh, explored by several clinical trials and also in mo the most recent guidelines, here you have the ASCO clinical practice guidelines, but also in our ESMO guidelines, it is clearly reported that sequential single agent chemotherapy should be offered and should be uh, the, um, the main cho choice in this patient population. Combination chemotherapy, combination regimen can be considered still, but especially in case of light threatening disease. And this is due to the fact that many clinical trials have explored the uh, opportunity to give uh, sequences versus combination of <clears throat> Uh, chemotherapeutic agents, and here you can see a meta-analysis by the Cochrane group, which failed to show any significant, statistically significant improvement, either in terms of progression-free survival and also in terms of overall survival, favoring combination chemotherapy. However, combination chemotherapy resulted more toxic, but not more effective. So basically, this is what the ASCO guidelines of last year suggest, they recommend actually that sequential single agent chemotherapy rather than combination therapy should be offered to metastatic breast cancer patients and that combination chemotherapy, combination chemotherapy may be considered for immediately life-threatening disease, which in any case is a rare condition in metastatic breast cancer. Another uh, clear point is the duration of chemotherapy, clear today, I mean, after after many clinical trials have explored the importance of prolonging chemotherapy until disease progression or for a sufficiently long period of time, all these trials randomized metastatic breast cancer patients to receive a fixed number of first-line chemotherapy versus the same type of chemotherapy or a different type of chemotherapy after an induction for a, a, a longer period of time until disease progression in most of these patients. When we put all these trials together to have some level of evidence, actually we were able to show a significant improvement in the progression-free survival favoring long-term chemotherapy 
with, with a decrease of 35% here you see in the risk of death, uh, in the risk of progression, and this was clearly statistically significant. And also we were able to show a significant improvement in overall survival with a 12% reduction in the risk of death favoring prolonged chemotherapy administration. So this is something that should be clear. Actually, when you see also all these new trials that, that are reported at major conferences, also combining chemotherapy with some targeted agents. Indeed, chemotherapy is never administered for a fixed number of cycles. is always administered until disease progression or until patient tolerability. Again, now we, we have many choices when we talk about chemotherapy because second and subsequent lines of chemotherapy are very important in metastatic breast cancer. Metastatic breast cancer is a chemosensitive disease. Here you see a report showing that actually uh, many patients received, actually here is the proportion of patients receiving chemotherapy and, you, and as you can see many patients are able to receive multiple lines of subsequent chemotherapies because metastatic breast cancer is a chemosensitive disease. So patients have the chance to give, uh, to, uh, to achieve a response to second and subsequent lines of chemotherapy. However, the chance to achieve this response is lower when you increase the number of previous chemotherapy lines. And this is a very important concept because we must uh, understand that given this, we should administer the most active agents in the first lines of chemotherapy and leave other types of uh, chemotherapeutic agents that are complicated by, uh, are, are more tolerable, for instance, for subsequent lines where the chance of achieving a response or, and the benefit in terms of progression-free survival and also overall survival is lower. And uh, so, in fact, also ASCO guidelines uh, outline this point, saying that second and later line of therapy may be of clinical benefit in this patient population and should be offered as determined by previous treatments and by all the, the, those factors that we saw before in the previous slides. I want now to show you this, this, this slide, which uh, uh, is very interesting in my opinion. This was uh, a mathematical model modeling paper that was published on British Medical Journal in 2005, so more than 10 years ago. And it matters with illness trajectories in several types of disease, in uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, dementia, and geriatric disease, and cancer. And this is the model for cancer. And as you can see, the, the cancer, the cancer patients, let's take into account that we have metastatic disease at the onset of incurable cancer, which is metastatic disease, the patient is in good shape, performance status is zero, and the patient actually can live for a long period of time in good shape and in good condition. And here you can administer the most active agents to achieve again in survival, you can administer the most effective strategies because the patients are likely to respond. The choice of first and second line of chemotherapy is really critical uh, and will condition the chance of survival of our patients. And of course, this time to functional decline is particularly important because when you have functional decline, actually, there is nothing that you can do. And small gain, uh, you can achieve small gain in time to progression, but it's very unlikely and the performance status of the patients is so worse that actually, the only thing that we can do to help these patients is to put it under uh, palliative care uh, with a specialized uh, physician for supportive treatments. So I think this is, this is very important because it actually describes how metastatic breast cancer evolves in the history of a patient. So, in fact, also ASCO guidelines, again, uh, underline that actually there is a number of second and third line treatment 
in metastatic breast cancer that have shown to be uh, to be able to induce a survival benefit when used in second and subsequent lines of chemotherapy. So it is very critical, the choice of treatment that we choose for second and subsequent lines. I would like to uh, focus on eribulin because eribulin actually is the last new and innovative chemotherapeutic agent that we have and is innovative for two reasons. Well, first of all, for its mechanism of, of action. In any case, it's a, a microtubule inhibitor, not, not a toxin, but I mean, it, it deals with something involved with replication with the to tumor cell proliferation as many others, but the way it was developed, it was really innovative because it was developed with a, in a randomized clinical trial for so best supportive care with, pri with overall survival as primary endpoint. And so when we saw this data from this drug at ASCO uh, some years ago, actually everybody was, it was an innovative trial design and in fact, this is the EMBRACE trial that was uh, presented where patients with heavily pretreated metastatic breast cancer who received either prior anthracycline and taxane and who were progressed under chemotherapy or within six months of the last chemotherapy regimen were randomized to receive eribulin. Uh, with the classical uh, sc schedule that we use uh, to, in everyday clinical practice today or versus the best supportive care as by physician choice. And physician choice, they could choose any chemotherapeutic agents, hormonal agent, biological or whatever, but even no treatment, palliative treatment or radiotherapy. And here are the results. Actually, this trial for the first time with this innovative design showed that eribulin were able to induce a significant improvement in, progress in overall survival as compared to best support care. So here the question of course is, but which is best supportive care? Well, best supportive care is chemotherapy because 99% of the patients were treated with first line, with the single agent chemotherapy that was allowed by the clinical trial design, including vinorelbin, which, was, which is a very active drug, gencitabine, capcitabine, taxanes, uh, anthracyclines, and other agents, and in some cases, hormonal agents. And here you can see that actually, uh, when you take into account all the different uh, uh, agents that were administered in the comparator or in the control arm, actually, eribulin compares favorably with most of them. So actually is a very good drug that was able to induce a survival improvement in modern ages versus other chemotherapeutic agents. Here is the pre-specified subgroup analysis which first indicated that there was a potential additional benefit, especially in the patient population of triple negative disease. And this actually is, is, is very important in my opinion, as I will show you later. This is the other study, that this was a non-inferiority study aimed to um, evaluate if eribulin has at least the same efficacy of capcitabine. Again, we had uh, heavily pretreated, but not that heavily as in the embrace patient population, at least two regimens, uh, no, at maximum two regimens for advanced breast cancer. And these patients were um, randomized to eribulin or capcitabine at conventional doses. And here is the results in terms of overall survival. There was no clear difference between the two arms. However, as you can see, there is, is an improvement of one month and a half, which is important in second and third line chemotherapy, favoring eribulin. And when we go again to overall survival in the, uh, her in the triple negative patient population, eribulin seems actually to be uh, a more active agent than capcitabine. By chance, capcitabine in another case series with many patients published in JCO three years ago was shown to be particularly active in the endocrine sensitive metastatic breast cancer. So again, here we have two treatment options. 
without any direct evidence, of course, but eribulin, which with a preferred activity in triple negative disease, and capsitabine with a preferred activity in endocrine sensitive disease. So we have multiple factors where we can base our decision on how to treat metastatic breast cancer. Quality of life is very important, and I think this, uh, <clears throat> this poster that was presented in ESMO a couple of years ago is very important because it shows that eribulin Eribulin, well, eribulin, we know that is more toxic than capsitabine. It has uh, hematological toxicity that could affect health-related quality of life. However, in this trial, in the trial where with the comparison with capsitabine, there was also an analysis in terms of quality of life with conventional uh, questionnaires from RTC. And again, eribulin <coughs> demonstrated to be, um, in terms of quality of life, uh, as effective as capsitabine. So no decrease, no deterioration in quality of life was observed in those patients who were treated with ribulin and IV drug versus an oral one in ribulin in terms of the most important issues re uh, considered in this quality of life uh, questionnaire. So in conclusion, ribulin and capsitabine provide clinical benefits uh, more or less uh, in, the same, uh, in the same way without any impact in health-related quality of life in metastatic breast cancer previously treated with anthracycline and taxanes. Uh, and here we are at the treatment algorithm. Uh, this is a slide I, I modified from Miguel Martin. Uh, actually, here is a summary of what we said until now. Uh, the treatment of metastatic breast cancer is conditioned by the type of the patient, the type of the disease, but basically also from the type of prior treatments in the adjuvant setting, in the first line and second line. So here is a sort of algorithm when you use uh, in the adjuvant or new adjuvant setting anthracycline and taxanes, it depends on the period that elapsed since the, the diagnosis of primary disease. You may have a short progression of short disease-free survival, and maybe you are in the presence of a triple negative disease here, so you could also administer the combination of gencitabine and carboplatin, and then in second line, eribulin. Again, here you can administer docetaxel and bevacizumab, and of course, then you have the other choice of gencitabine per carboplatin. As uh, as last issues, you could also administer capsitabine, navelbin, and also anthracycline rechallenge, which is not the topic of today. Uh, then you have, again, the triple negative population, because it's the most dangerous patient population where we have to administer chemotherapy sooner or later. Uh, and here you have, again, short disease-free survival, long disease-free survival, but these patients received a platinum in the, as part of their adjuvant adjuvant or better new adjuvant regimen, and so the first choice is probably or capsitabine, vinorabine, or the combination of paritaxel and bevacizumab, and then again eribulin and other treatment agents, and finally uh, when you have the chemo naive patients, as often it happens in triple negative disease, you can administer whatever you want as first line chemotherapy, and then all the other uh, lines are uh, following the, the, the choice that you make in the first line treatment of triple negative metastatic breast cancer. So if to conclude, uh, uh, which are the assumptions regarding chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer? Metastatic breast cancer can never be cured. But extending survival matters and many a lot of evidence now is showing that this is possible uh, without significant toxicity. Quality of life matters, but we must also remember, and it is clear from the trial of eribulin versus capsitabine, that quality of life reflects a balance between cancer-related symptoms and treatment-related toxicity. Uh, finally, not all chemotherapy regimens are equally toxic, and I would say that they are not even equally active. So the choice that we made for first, second, third lines should take into account this. Of course, it is important to understand, and it clearly uh, was uh, presented by the other speakers, although 
mainly in, in Russian, <laughs> that metastatic breast cancer is a heterogeneous disease. Uh, when we target only the HER2 pathway, let, let's take into account the results of the, of the trial with TDM1. It, this may not be the right choice. For instance, in the new adjuvant trial, we clearly, it was clearly shown that uh, you that the combination with chemotherapy achieved better results in the chemo-naive patients. So the, we must take into account also the heterogeneity of the metastatic disease that never requires one targeting of one pathway or another pathway in, in a separate way. But maybe we should also increase the use of combination of different targets in, in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer maybe with uh, appropriate clinical trials. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we must fully identify targets. Uh, and this is what we should do to better assess the appropriateness of chemotherapy when we administer to our patient. Thank you for our, your attention. Thank you very much. One moment, please. Thank you very much for a very большой topic. Есть ли вопросы к докладчику? В зале есть переводчик? If there are any questions, if there are any questions. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree with your uh, topic and um, I comment, I, I to comment your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to stress uh, such uh, an issue that now we're women are now we're living approximately at a median of 80 years. And uh, agent, aging is only one incurable disease. Hence, if we have uh, an incurable d disease in case if it's not lymphoma, if it's not leukemia, then the treatment which we perform should be any way potentially aimed for improvement of uh, quality of life in the patient. And even at the ASK, a report was presented that the patients which obtain, uh, uh, which uh, get better quality life of quality of life, these patients live longer. And if we have no visceral crisis, and in your and uh, your report uh, have demonstrated in a brilliant way, in in absence of visceral crisis, crisis we prefer more chemotherapy that is such such as urgent help urgent aid urgent care which uh, allows us to 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 overcome the symptoms of visceral crisis next report